I'll tell you what, the the ranch is a hub of activity today. Not only there, there's a bunch of guys working yeah. out today, okay? And one who will join us here in just a moment. And so when I drove in, and I don't know how much luck you had, I came in the parking lot where we normally park, and there's nowhere to park. No park. So I yeah. said, okay, well, I'm going to park back by the players, and I'm thinking, you know what I'm going to do? Because they've got some designated spots for some of the players who worked out really well last mm -hmm. year, and they get mm -hmm. preferential mm -hmm. parking. I'm going, I'm parking in DeMarcus Ware's spot. <laughs> Right? I love it. Who's going to kick it. me out, right? Right. And I got there, somebody had already thought of it. They were parking in DeMarcus Ware's spot. He's only been gone a week, and they've already taken his parking spot. Who was it? Well, I don't know. It was just some car was there, and it was it was a little nicer looking than mine, yeah, I mean, by the way. Shocking. Let me say, we should pull back the curtain here a little bit. We literally just flew in here. We were going to do the Google Plus Hangout today, Mickey and, Miller, Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour. We were going to do it in the Cowboys TV's... A uh, radio booth, right. radio broadcast booth, but the Cowboys TV department wrapped up a show. We came right in here, and here we are. And let's not wait any further because we have a special guest today, a new member of the Dallas Cowboys, so to speak. Hadn't been around here for too long. Spent a season with Dallas last year, and he now he's coming in to join us right now, Caesar Rayford. Now, if we had applause, we would have it, you know, shake. And this just kind of shows you right how here. versatile our show can be, right? <laughs> we can do just about anything, and look at there, it even See, looks there pretty are. good, right? Have you ever done the Google Plus Hangout thing? Uh, no, I haven't. No. So we're gonna I teach like you some it. new technology. I like here, it. Huh? I'm going to take a picture of us, actually. I love it. I love it. Smile at the camera. I'm going to take a picture and tweet. Ready? One, two, three. Smile. I appreciate it. <laughs> now, I like it. I like it. Now, Caesar and I have actually been trading uh, telephone calls and text messages oh, yeah. because I have been trying to get in touch with him to do a story with him because we're doing some stories on Cowboys players throughout the off season. And, and Caesar does some really cool stuff. Now, I know up in the Seattle area, you've been really focused on helping kids in the community and, and kind of sending a positive message. But now you're bringing that to North Texas. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that. We'll talk uh, football in a second, right. but I want to hear about uh, this. My thing is all about uh, working with the kids. I do love working with the kids because, you know, they're definitely our future. And uh, I've been doing a lot of programs just to motivate kids, kind of get kids, you know, to think brilliant in their lives, you know, pushing themselves, you know, to be, you know, better than what they want to be and pushing high expectations for themselves because, you know, they're going to be the future. And, you know, I definitely like going to work with the kids and motivate them and, you know, letting them helping them with goal setting and just motivating them because, you know, we have a society where, you know, kind of things you know, is kind of laid off a little bit, you know, and just basically get out of the community, get everything re-energized and, you know, being, you know, where I'm at now, using my influence to maybe help motivate kids, you know, to push to what they want to be, to push to where their dreams want to be. Well, I've been doing many different things. I've been going to a bunch of high, uh, high schools, talking to the football teams. I've been going to elementary, talking to the kids there. Um, I did some stuff at Western Hills Elementary where mm -hmm. we did uh, mm -hmm. help out pass out books and stuff with George Selvey, uh, Jason Hatcher. You know, we're down there working with kids, you know, giving them prizes, you know, and motivate them to, you know, to do better, to push themselves. Uh, I did some uh, different things. I actually been uh, working at a juvenile center in, um, off, outside of Dallas, Texas, and um, working with the kids that's kind of, they're not secure kid, but, you know, they're kind of almost there, you know, just kind of help them out and, um, you know, get them on the right track and motivate them to, you know, make better decisions because, you know, every decision you make in your life now is going to affect you for the future. And just, man, just using my staff to be able to help out the kids because, you know, I was a kid there and I was influenced and, you know, why not, you know, have our future be just as blessed as us. And um, it's just a blessing to be able to the opportunity to go out there and talk to the kids and just help do things in the community. Um, the other day I had, uh, I was out in um, Cedar, it was Cedar, Cedar Hill. Cedar Hill. Yeah, we yeah. were talking on Friday. Yeah. That's somewhere in North Texas. I'm mm -hmm. like, yes, it is. Oh, they yeah. got a very good athletic department mm -hmm. at Cedar Hill High School. They so do. So we was out there doing uh, uh, Citizens Against Violence. So we actually was out there for a 5K. So I actually well, went. I actually ran the 5K. I was going to be uh, my next question. <laughs> Yeah, so what was your time? That's uh, the we, we ain't going to talk about that. <laughs> no, I, I did it. You know, I had a good ride. It was definitely a good event because a lot of the community came out, a lot of support. You know, everybody that came out there, it was definitely a great opportunity. And uh, it was just good for everybody in the community coming together to, you know, work against, you know, you know announce that the violence that's going on with kids. And it was definitely a blessing opportunity and just loved everything about it. You know, it just, it's nothing but a great feeling when the community comes together for, you know, any kind of special event like that. And, but it definitely was good. And, uh, yeah, so i just been bouncing around, just trying to do all I can in the community because, you know, I've, I've always been a part doing things in the community because, you know, you know, the community is our future, you know, and everything about it 
is just a blessing. Well, to make sure you guys have been paying attention, uh, Caesar Rayford came to the Cowboys last summer, I guess was the end of uh, training camp, right before the beginning of the season. They traded for him from the uh, Indianapolis Colts, where he had a really good preseason uh, defensive end, played a little defensive tackle, was on the 53-man roster, the practice squad, the 53-man roster. So I'm guessing now that you've kind of acclimated yourself to the team, uh, this is a really important off season mm -hmm. and will be an important training camp for. Oh you. yeah, definitely. It's definitely a great opportunity, you know, especially to be able to come out here and be out here for the, you know, off season and train and work with the guys and you know and getting the, um, getting the continuity together and just getting everything, you know, because you know one now I say my most important word, you know, is work, you know, and just love being around here, putting the work in, just getting ready, you know, for the next upcoming season and just you know have high expectations to go out there and do great things. Now, I, I imagine when you uh, when you got here and you're sitting there and looking at the Cowboy roster and you're sitting there going, okay, I'm a defensive end, defensive tackle, whatever they want me to be, but they got a, two guys coming off Pro Bowls, some guy named Marcus Ware and Anthony Spencer, <laughs> no and then sure. Jason Hatcher, who's coming off his first Pro Bowl, mm -hmm. and they were hoping Jay Ratliff is back, who had been to the Pro Bowl. And now those guys are gone. Well, yeah, and now you're here, and it's, it seems like a great opportunity for it's you. It's definitely a great opportunity, you no know, opportunity to fill some big shoes. And, you know, whatever, you know, it's all in this profession, it's all about the next man stepping up. And, uh, you know, what other uh, great opportunity to be able to fill those shoes? I mean, no one's never going to fill those shoes, but hopefully we go in there and, you know, make things happen. Because uh, those, you know, DeMarcus Ware, Jason Hatcher, you know, those were amazing players. Anthony Spencer, Radliff, like, you know. All of guys, Hall of Famer guys, you know, and just, you know, it's definitely a great opportunity because, you know, it kind of pushes you to, you know, motivate you because, you know, when he was here with those guys, it's just, you know, be able to be in the front of Jason Hatchett, you know, Anthony Spencer, DeMarcus Ware, you know, these guys are just, you know, amazing athletes, amazing players, amazing men, you know, and just be able to take things from them and learn from them and use it for us for the next offseason because, you know, it's always about opportunities and, it's just, it's just definitely a blessing. So We are here with Caesar Rayford, a member of the Dallas Cowboys, who just finished his workout looking to make a name for himself on the defensive line this year in 2014. And like Mickey said, that opportunity is there. Can you pull back the curtain for us a little bit as we pull back the curtain for you watching mm -hmm. us on Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour here? Um, can you let us know maybe a thing or two? that DeMarcus or Jason Hatcher or Anthony Spencer has shared with you that you can tangibly put into your game and use up this season? Um, basically, it's just, you know, they always taught us to, like, you know, don't go out there and think too much. Just go out there and be yourself and play because, you know, when you start thinking about things, you kind of get you away from yourself. You know, one thing I say is what you do best is do what you do best. You know, it's not about, you know, doing what DeMarcus Ware does well or what Jason has. It's all about doing what you can do, you know, what, what your abilities is. And they always talk about focus on your abilities and then excel in that. And um, just the great motivation and tips from them just because, you know, those guys, you know, they walk with their heads high, you know, and very high expectation. And it's always, they always say push, you know, whatever it is you want to do, keep pushing for it, keep working for it, you know, and just and just keep working at it, stay at it. You know, no matter what obstacles might be in front of you, just stay at it. You know, and one day with Marcus Ware, he's like, man, use those long arms. <laughs> <laughs> What's your wingspan here? Show uh, us. You I, can I play mean, some I'm basketball. Not even, I'm not even, I think I'm in. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Yeah, you played some basketball. Oh, yeah. I was oh, definitely, yeah. Basketball was my first love, you know, and definitely, especially me being 6'7", yeah. and some change, you know, I, everybody thinks I play basketball, and uh, but it definitely can use that wingspan out there. I think I'm about, I don't know, I think I'm about 7 feet wingspan, something like that. Let's see. It's out Let's there. Let's see. <laughs> Seven feet, so what is that, 84 inches, yeah, 85 yeah, inches? Yeah, roughly, yeah. 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 I'm pretty, I'm pretty He's long. He's got some length to him, which is a yeah. good thing so when you're playing on the So wondering, I, and I know the workouts you do now are kind of on your own. The coaches aren't supposed to be there watching or And anything. they are not there are watching. Let's keep them. that yes. clear. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, but it, with conversations you might have had, do they look? They still look at you as a defensive end? Do you feel that's your spot? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm open to play anything. You know, the more flexibility I could be, you know, the, the more I could help out. You know, that's definitely my goal. And uh, But I think, yeah, mostly defensive end, maybe some D-tackle and pass, pass rush situa yeah. situations and stuff. But, yeah, I'm just just pushing myself, you know, I'm pushing my body, and man, just I just love working. That's all it is. I, you know, I'm a blue collar type of guy, and just love to go out there and work. So I don't know how much you pay attention to all the talk after you know Hatch 
leaves, DeMarcus Ware leaves, Spencer still trying to get healthy again, mm -hmm. and everybody's saying, well, the Cowboys don't have any defensive ends. Do you mm -hmm. kind of quietly listen to that and go, okay, I'll show oh, you? Oh, yeah, you know, you just, I definitely, you know, you listen to it, but you're just like, you know what, hey, you know, it's based on opportunity to show up, you know, because, you know, if you go back from what happened in the past, you know, you know, that's what everybody's based upon. But, you know, I just like, I just like his motivation to push. And he's like, you know what? Hey, I was going to go out there and work hard, and then we'll see what happens when the season comes. Then, you know, then they can make their decisions from there. And you got a good example from last year. George Selby basically came in mm -hmm. here as a camp body. They needed just warm yeah. bodies during training camp, and suddenly he's in the starting lineup, yeah. finishes with seven sacks. So, you know, given an opportunity, done. you know, everybody was, you know, marking him off, and look what he did. You know, it's funny because, like, the whole season we were known as the, the no names. Right. Isn't that true? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, I definitely, we, you know, we definitely got a chip on our shoulder, and, uh, we're definitely ready to come in this off season, you know, to, you know, cause make us better, make us better at defensive line, cause you know, Coach Marinelli and Leon Lett, you know, those guys are heck of a coaches, and um, they're definitely gonna push us to the next level, and uh, also, also us pushing each other to the next level, because you know, you know, what we have is what we have, and so we gotta motivate each other, you know, and push each other, and you know, and expect high expectations and set high goals, cause you know, if you push yourself with those high goals and expectations, you're gonna you're going to get there. Yeah, I know this defense definitely has something to prove and wants to improve from oh, yeah. last season. A reminder, you can ask us questions throughout the Google Plus Hangout with our Q&A app that we have enabled for you. have a question here from Nate Trumbull who asks Caesar, are you concentrating on left or right end this offseason? Because with the departure of DeMarcus Ware, everybody's mm -hmm. wondering about a pass rushing defensive end. <laughs> um, I'm, definitely, I'm definitely up to play both sides. Uh, I'm, you know, I want to be able to be flexible so I can play left and right. Uh, I, I want to be flexible where I can move around because, I, you know, the more you can do, the more I can help out. You know, especially with the length and the size I have, I think I'm able to play left, right, or even, you know, inside situations. Um, but right now, my focus is just, you know, just becoming a complete pair, develop myself, and uh, be the best I can. Awesome. Caesar, thank you so much oh, for welcome. joining us. Hopefully we didn't take you away exactly. from your workout too oh, much. No, you're done, right? Work in, yeah. All right, man. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for stopping by. I'll be checking by. in with you next week because mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing a story on Caesar and some of the good efforts that he's trying to make in the community right here in North Texas. I'll be checking in with you Alrighty. very shortly. Well, and you can check one of those stories out on the Cowboys Blitz as well as on Dallas Cowboys television programming throughout the season once the regular season begins. Thanks, Caesar. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you, man. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you, you learn some new technology. There you go. Start yeah. one of your own. Anytime you want to join us on the Google Plus Hangout, you are more than invited. Okay, thank, okay, you, thank, thank you. you. Take care. Right, Watch your step you. going down there. All right. Thank you guys so much for dealing with our little impromptu guest who we loved having on with us. That was Dallas Cowboys defensive lineman Caesar Ray for joining us. Now time to dive into what has been happening with the Dallas Cowboys throughout this what is becoming a pretty eventful week. Hello, Henry Melton, who returns to town. The Cowboys signed Henry Melton to a free agent deal that has lots of incentives. Henry Melton can make a little bit of money, or he can make a lot of money. He's coming off a season in which he only played three games, tore his ACL last year, but Mickey, he feels he can be a big contributor to the Dallas Cowboys, particularly because he's being reunited with Rod Marinelli. And Rod Marinelli was the key guy in this entire deal, the swing, the uh, free agent signing with uh, Henry Melton. You know, he visited about three, four other teams. Matter of fact, came in here and uh, went to uh, visit another team afterwards uh, that didn't get the deal done. But when we talked to him yesterday, I talked to him as just before he signed the contract, after he signed the contract. And, and I said, so when did you know this was going to work out here? He goes, when I got here and I went to dinner with Rod Marinelli. So Rod Marinelli had a big hand in convincing Henry Melton to sign here and he said but I decided oh I had the visit scheduled I'll go take the visit he goes but in my mind it was a done deal they just had to knock out the financial ramifications of the deal the other thing I thought was key that he said is he said every place he went he said obviously everybody wanted to check out the knee when you right. have your ACL uh, surgically repaired uh, and it was in October. He's only like five months, five and a half months removed from that surgery. Obviously, that's going to be the topic of discussion. And he said every place he's been, all the teams, uh, trainers, doctors, whoever checked him out, told him it looks like you're right on schedule. It doesn't look like you have any problems. So his goal is to be ready to play football the beginning of training camp. And knowing the Cowboys uh, training staff, uh, even if he's ready, 
they will go very slowly with them and, and kind of ease them back into playing football because their goal is have them ready for the season opener. Don't worry about training camp I ready uh, for the season opener. So, yeah, it was uh, uh, he was excited to be here. It's basically coming home uh, for Henry Mountain. He uh, was uh, lived uh, majority of his life in Grapevine, Texas, which is just about 10 miles here uh, from away. the ranch. Uh, went to Grapevine High, went to University of Texas, and as he was telling people yesterday that uh, his mom's house is about 10 minutes away from where we're at right now. He said, so if there's a late night here, I, you know, whatever, I can go sleep there. I don't, I don't have to worry about going home. So he's pretty fired up about being back here, Gina. And you may be able to ask the questions better than I can just keep on rambling. But the key, the key thing I thought was how they structured the contract. And there's it was very pat friendly. Right. And then that's sort of the focus with both the Henry Melton and the Brandon Whedon signing, which we'll get into in just a little bit. The Cowboys are focused on cat friendly deals. And I think you can do a good job of explaining this a little bit further because it is intricate. It is nuanced. And we actually have a picture of Henry Melton that this Mickey Spagnola took. My new photography exactly, career. Exactly. You didn't know of uh, Henry signing the contract with one of the Cowboys personnel executives, Todd Melton, who's growing a beard here. I'm like, wow. Go. Todd, Todd and Melton, Todd, Todd Williams, Williams and Todd and Melton. Todd and Melton. This was a good lesson for me to remember to always carry my cell phone with Very me. Very smart. Because I usually leave it. I irritate everybody in the TV department because I leave it on my desk right. and then it starts ringing. <laughs> and it doesn't right. go into voicemail soon enough and everybody gets irritated by me. So I've been trying to remember to put it in my pocket. And it just so happened I had it in my pocket this time. And uh, they were putting down uh, and, and they were going over all the details of the contract and everything. And so here, explain some of here's the learned. bottom line. Uh, what, what you're going to see is uh, people are saying he can make up to $5 million this year. That is accurate. Uh, what you're also seeing is he has a $1.25 million base salary. That is accurate. But he's also got some other things in there. He's got a $500,000 workout bonus, which they told him, we want you to earn that, meaning you have to have so much, uh, so many percentage of workouts that are scheduled here in the offseason once they can begin, like April 21st. Was uh, that a concern? Uh, they, I don't know if it was a concern. They do that with a lot of guys, but I think especially with a guy coming off an ACL, uh, it's another way to give them some money that's just not base salary. Uh, in other words, some incentive. Uh, he also uh, has a, uh, I guess you can call it incentive, and they've got to account for this on the cap. They put in another incentive of uh, uh, you, you can make uh, up to, I, I believe it was one, and a quarter million dollars uh, if you play all, if you're on the 46-man roster, meaning the game day roster. So for every game he's on the game day roster, he earns $78,000. But they have to account for that because they can't sit there and all of a sudden the cap keeps growing game by game by game. And it's like, oh, do we have enough money in the cap to take care of this? So they budget that in their cap. So when all said and done, uh, they, in their minds, they have to have $3.5 million of cap space for Henry Melton. It, 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 if he doesn't play in any games, then it's only going to cost him like two and a half, two point seven million. million. So as you can see, it's a very first-year cap friendly. Uh, there's another million and a half he can make when it comes to playing time and sacks. Okay, But because that wasn't likely to be earned, he didn't do that last year, then if he earns that money, it goes on the cap next year. So again, the most he would count him this year is 3.5 million and if he's healthy and he can get back to playing the way he was playing in 2012, that's an absolute steal. It's a bargain. And then the other good part of this contract is if he's good and, and, and he's worth the money, the Cowboys keep him on the 80-man the roster the first day of next year, the league year, then the three-year option kicks in the three-year options worth $24 million. He has a $9 million guarantee in that option. And all the money right now is in base salary. It's not signing bonus because you don't want to pay the, you know, and, and then something goes wrong. So they can convert the $9 million in guaranteed money into signing bonus and then prorate it over the life of the contract, which is three years, to reduce the cap hit. So right now, if somebody looked and saw the option and they saw what the cap hit was, it, it's going to be like almost $10 million. But 
don't worry, that can get taken care of. So again, it's cap friendly to the Cowboys, and as Henry Melton said, I'm betting on myself. Yeah. I'm betting that I will get back to playing the way I was once playing, and I'll eventually earn the money. And I, I was curious, it's like, well, who came up with this idea to structure the contract that way? Because it's pretty, uh, you know, they, they came up with a really good idea. Uh, it, it's not just a normal contract, and and I was told that his agent Jordan Roy suggested okay, Dallas here's man. A, yep. here in Jordan here in Dallas. Uh, he he said let's let's set it up where we give you some protection, the the first year, mm -hmm. let us prove ourselves, but then you give us the money the second, third, and fourth year, and 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 so it's really a, a safe contract. Uh, for the Cowboys, and again, it's the club option. It's not like he's going to come in here and prove himself and say, "Nah, I think I'll go somewhere else." You know, that it's the Cowboys that can keep him on the 80-man roster. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the of the contract that I think everybody uh, needs to uh, understand. But again, the key thing in there, other than the the base salary, the signing bonus, and some incentives, is how many times is he on the 46-man roster on game day? Okay, what sort of contributions is he going to make to this defense in 2014? I think that's what a lot of people are wondering. Um, you're looking at a picture now from Henry Melton's Instagram account with Todd Williams, the bearded man, signing the contract. <laughs> um, is that in the conference room, Jerry's conference room? It is room? in the marketing conference okay, room right across yep. from where the media library it is. It is a, a beautiful conference room with great granite, as you can see. So Henry Melton had... 15 and a half sacks in his career, uh, best season of his entire NFL career in 2012 under Rod Marinelli with the Chicago Bears when he went to the Pro Bowl. Right. Lots of questions here coming in right now. We will get to those questions at about oh, in about 20 minutes or so here on Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour. So tangibly, what can he do when he was at the University of Texas? We saw him do a lot of things. I know a lot a of Longhorn fans are uh, impressed with the athleticism of Henry Melton. What can you expect from him on Rod Marinelli's defensive line? Well, he's going to be the three technique guy, uh, the under tackle, the guy that's on the move, basically play in the same position that Jason Hatcher played in. Uh, they need a guy that can get up field uh, and, and create havoc, and that's what they want him to do. You know, when you look at him, Gina, um, he's not that big. I right. mean, he's, he's not, not like a monster. Right. Uh, he's about 200, and, I say not that big, well, but he's 280 some pounds. And relatively speaking, though, is that because he's coming off a year in which he was rehabbing all year? Had to be careful. Yes, exactly. Yeah. He may have to put on a little bit of weight, right. maybe change his body type a little bit going into 20. Quickness and speed is the ultimate uh, aspect you need uh, at that position. They want guys that are quick, move force teams to block them, uh, make sure that who's ever the defensive end on his right side uh, is not getting double teamed by the guard, not let the center be able to take care of him. And so, yeah, I, I think Rod Marinelli knew all they need to know, all he needed to know about uh, what this guy can do. And again, and, and I don't want to just assume that you just returned from ACL surgery and you're fine and right. good because it takes some time. Uh, but I think they feel good. And the good thing about a defensive lineman is, you know, he doesn't have to run 40 yards. He doesn't have to run 30 yards. He doesn't have to regain his speed. He's got to regain his quickness, and he's got to regain his confidence in that knee that it's going to hold up there uh, in the trenches. If he can do that, uh, I think the Cowboys have got a guy now at defensive tackle spot uh, that they can count on and, and be a pretty productive player, again, assuming he can get back to his 2012 Form. Okay, let's move from the defensive side of the ball to the offensive side of the ball because the Cowboys have a new guy as well. Anybody who's a fan of Big 12 football knows Brandon Whedon. He, a former Oklahoma State Cowboy. Boone Pickens was a big fan of his. I can tell you that for sure. Cowboys signed him to a backup deal, and I know some Cowboys fans are wondering, well, hey, we had Kyle Orton in here last right. year, and we've heard some talks that Kyle Orton may be considering retirement. From my personal experience, Mickey, and you can certainly speak to this as well, anytime a guy considers retirement, it usually means he's heading towards the barn door. <laughs> I mean, it really does. And usually that's kind of where they are directed. Um, the Brandon Whedon deal was a cap-friendly deal. Uh, he may have something to prove. It remains to be seen what he will do here with the Cowboys. But what are your thoughts on the Cowboys bringing in another man to their quarterback roster? As I've been trying to tell everybody, this is a free look. It doesn't cost the Cowboys a red cent right now. 
Okay, it's not like you had to sign a guy to this big multi-year deal with a signing bonus, and this is the Cow Cowboys quarterback of the future. He's the Cowboys' third quarterback of March, April, May, <laughs> June, July, and August, assuming Orton right. comes back. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, about Orton here in a minute. But the Cowboys get to bring him in. They didn't have to pay him any signing bonus. They basically paid him two uh, on the contract. It's a two-year deal with minimum base salary. So his base salary is $570,000. But none of that counts against the cap until he makes the team. So, again... Maybe they gave him moving expenses. I don't know. Uh, but again, all, he's going to come here and try to prove that he's worth keeping. And don't he just has something to prove. Yeah, he does. And don't just assume that, okay, this is the young guy of the future because he's not a young guy. He's 31 right. years old. He was an older quarterback. Uh, he was old because he had played in four or five years of baseball before he went to Oklahoma State. Cowboys liked him coming out of the draft at Oklahoma State. That. And they kind of considered him in that late second round category in the draft. Now, obviously Cleveland jumped up and said, well, we need a quarterback. We'll take him in the first round. And then he got thrown in there, and it, it really wasn't a good situation. But it, one thing that sticks in my mind about Brandon Whedon, well, two things. First one, when I interviewed him at the Senior Bowl a couple of years ago, I was amazed how just mature he was, and he wasn't just some young kid and you know, he, he was married, you know, he, 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 he had a head on his shoulders, right? He was right? 26, 27 at the time, right? Well, in the Senior Bowl, he was already 28, 28? 29, yeah. yeah. So, again, uh, that and the fact that if you go back to 2012 when Cleveland came here and played the Cowboys, he almost beat them. You know, the Cowboys had to come from behind to win 23-20, if, if I remember correctly. And he played awfully well. So, again, the Cowboys can bring him in, see what he has. Tony Romo's not going to be out here uh, in April and May taking all the snaps he normally would take coming off the back surgery. So you're going to need another arm at least. And we'll see what happens with, with Orton. But, again, I, I just think this is a good deal to bring in a mature quarterback. And the other thing I want to point out is whatever he did or didn't do in Cleveland, the Cowboys should know about him because the offensive coordinator last year uh, in the Cleveland with the Cleveland Browns was North Turner. And Jason Garrett and North Turner are still pretty tight. They don't so have a good relationship, I would do imagine they? he picked his brain about, hey, what do you think if I bring this in myself, Wade Wilson, we work with him, what do you think? And Scott Linehan, and, and I'm sure Norv gave him, you know, the seal of approval. Go, yeah, why not? See what he can do. And if he develops, great. If he doesn't after two years, then you say, okay, well, we just bring in somebody else. The other thing, because he's not costing him anything, don't think that just just means automatically that in the third or fourth round the Cowboys would pass on a quarterback that they think right. is worth taking at that point because they've got Brandon Whedon. That won't enter their discussion. They can say, okay, we take four quarterbacks to camp and let's see who makes the team. Okay, so now the question is, will this young man make the team in, oh, let's say about 22, 24 years? <laughs> How about this? We're going to show you a picture of... Young Rivers Romo, Canyon Dis Romo and Tony Romo. Uh, it's the newest addition to their gorgeous family. Here's the picture right there. Uh, Tony sent this picture to one of my favorite people, Steve Dennis. Uh, sent this picture to Steve Dennis yesterday. So there's Candace and Rivers Romo joining Brother Hawkins. He was 8 pounds, 12 ounces. Already has size to his advantage. Now, Candace, as beautiful as she is, Mickey, she's also a good athlete. She's right. a basketball player in school. She plays golf. Um, See, this is what athletes should think about <laughs> when they're deciding the gene their future pool. spouses. Yes. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, get, yeah. Get, get you, a, you know, you got great genes if you're a professional athlete. Right. Now find you a wife that has some athletic genes I'll too. I'll show you, you a know? picture here of the full family. I sound like I should be like head of the athletic commission in Russia in 1970. <laughs> Good luck with right? that. <laughs> Good luck with that. Here's the picture of the entire Romo family with Hawkins, Rivers, the newest addition. As well as Candace. Well, you just got everything. Tony. I'm telling you, you got to have everything nowadays, Mickey, right? So you can see in here Steve Dennis tweeting it right there. Very cute. Very, very good. Family, nice. Aren't they? Very happy for him. Very happy for the Romo family. Let's just sit. Take a moment. And now we're going to answer some of your questions. Got a ton of questions here in here from you. We're going to rip through a bunch of these. Um, and these are coming in on Google Plus? On Google Plus. Oh, so not on, not on our Twitter accounts, which, by the way, you can do that at, at Spags52, mm -hmm. at, at that Sports Girl. Girl. 
You can send us a question on any platform, really. Uh, this question here, I know it's one that everybody wants to know, Mickey, from Martin Homa. What's your take on Josh Brent? Have you heard anything on his return? I have not heard anything uh, on his potential return. Again, uh, his 180-day uh, sentence uh, would be up in the middle of July. But again, even if he decided he wanted to come back and try to play football again, I would imagine that Roger Goodell and the NFL might have something to say about just when that might happen. And they wouldn't say anything until he actually signs with a team. And if they decide the NFL needs to punish him also, then you know there could be a several game uh, stipulation there where you know he wouldn't be eligible to play. So it's a thought. But it's a thought in the back of your mind. It's not something I don't think that you would sit there and try to count on and say, well, I don't need this in the draft because I got Josh Brent coming back. Yeah, one I wouldn't bank on. Right. Put it that way. Absolutely. Very simply said. But good question. Yes, and it's one, frankly, that I get quite a bit whenever I talk to people about the Dallas Cowboys. This is a question from Ezra Salami that I believe he meant for Caesar Rayford, but we can do our best I'll answer to help you maybe uh, – have a better understanding to the answer to this question. What is the difference from Coach Ron from a D end and a Rushman technique wise? What do you do differently? And Mickey, I know that you've had some conversations about this and you really can shed some light on this. A D end and a Rushman? Rushman. Not not Rushmore, but Rushmen. Well, that's that's but, basically Rod Marinelli's nickname for his defensive linemen. He doesn't just want defensive linemen who are cumbersome. He wants guys that can get after the quarterback, so he calls them rushmen. They're all rushmen. Anybody that lines up on that front four is a, <laughs> is rushman. a rushman. If the blitzing, if the linebacker's blitzing, he's a rushman. And uh, he, he's pretty funny about uh, how he deals with these guys. And he was a happy camper yesterday. He was kind of showing uh, Henry Melton around after he signed his contract, uh, brought him into the locker room, and and. Uh, uh, showed him where the meeting rooms were, showed him in the locker room. Uh, by the way, he was wearing a University of Missouri uh, sweatshirt. Which you too, loved, I know. The Missouri assistant coaches a couple of weeks ago came in here to uh, list, or to list, uh, to work with the Cowboys assistants, uh, give them some tips, and uh, it was pretty funny because I was talking with Monty Kiffin uh, in the hallway and saying, well, I hope you help those guys out and ta taught them how to um, – uh, play against the option offense, right? He goes, oh, yeah, they struggle with that. He goes, but you know what? They're pretty good. He goes, as a matter of fact, they did so well in the SEC. Maybe we should have gone and visit them and see what oh, they're doing. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, that's good. Okay, there you go. Okay, well, so hopefully that answered your question. As we're moving right along here, hey, thank you, Lance Losberg. Uh, this is a great new forum. Hope you guys continue with it. My question is, what do you believe is the Cowboys' strategy concerning the draft and financial ability to sign other free agents when it comes to positions? And when I hear that term, financial ability, I can only um, think of Mark Cuban after the Mavericks won the NBA title and what he said, financial flexibility. And frankly, I know that's a term that fans hate to hear. They hate to hear about the finances of an NFL team, but it it's important. No, it absolutely is. And you have to, have to always consider that. So, as I said, they have to budget $3.5 million against the cap for uh, Henry Melton. So that means they are around $4 million, $4.5 million left under the cap before they mm -hmm. get the money for Miles Austin's uh, June 1 release. Now, understand with Miles Austin, they'll pick up $5.5 million. Uh, the projection of cost for their draft to fund their draft. Uh, is 5.3 million. So basically, that's like a savings account. That'll just sit there, and then June 1, they'll get that money, and they'll be able to afford their draft. So right now, as you can see, with only $4 million available, uh, they would still be picking and choosing. They wouldn't be going out there and signing Jared Allen. As a matter of fact, I was told when Jared Allen left here, they weren't even sure what the guy wanted because they, but it sounds like he wants a contract. Interesting. Inter, uh, Co comparable to what DeMarcus Ware got, comparable to what Julius Peppers got, and obviously the Cowboys don't have money uh, to do that. I think if they do anything else in free agency, it might be 
structuring a similar deal to Melton's for Anthony Spencer. Okay. Now, they're going to have to see where he's at. He's here working out, uh, but again, I think they've got to get a better feel of exactly where that knee is coming back from the microfracture surgery before they invest any money in him. But he's taken visits. He's gotten no takers yet because obviously he can't even work out for He can't do anything for anybody uh, right now. But the Cowboys know him. They know what he's about. He knows the Cowboys. They can say, hey, here's a one-year deal. Here's a million dollars. You know, and then we'll bet on you for three more years down the line if you show you can play. And I think that's something he's going to have to consider because, obviously, if you take all these visits and no one's signing you, well, that means they're not offering you the money you want to take. And there's no sense signing a long-term deal, a multi-year deal, for low dollars when you think you're worth a lot more. So you say, okay, do like Henry Melton. Let me gamble on myself. You sign me for one year. I'll prove I can still play. There goes my water. Anything and, happens on Mickey and right? Miller's Cowboys Hour. We've Absolutely. proven that. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I can play. Uh, if I can do this, then I'll get my money. Uh, give me a chance to prove myself. And that's what he's looking for uh, right now. So there might be some money spent there. But after that, they've just got to, uh, you know, find something to fall in their lap. Unless they're going to want to restructure somebody else's contract. Uh, to create more cap space, and that's one thing they kept saying they didn't want to do. They didn't want to do. That's why they didn't bring. Uh, they, that, that's why they cut to Marcus Ware. They didn't want to keep pushing money back. That's why they didn't pay that big a contract to Jason Hatcher that the Redskins did. They didn't want to invest that much money in a guy that was 32 years old. Thank you for your question, Lance, and thank you for the feedback. A reminder, you can always participate in the conversation by in sending us a question right here on the Q&A app on the Google Plus Hangout page. You can always tweet us a question as well. We're going to get to some more questions in just a moment, Mickey, but you mentioned Jared Allen, and we know that he visited the Cowboys this week, and I love what you said about this. You said the Cowboys are not sure what the guy wanted, and I think the signs are pointing in the direction that the Cowboys are going to go in a different direction and not move forward with him. Yeah, I would think so. And now with this chunk of money taken out of the salary cap, they really can't afford to do that. You would have to restructure somebody's contract and then give money uh, to a 32-year-old guy. Now, the good thing about Jared Allen is at least he's coming off a good season. I uh, had multi-digit sacks. Uh, he's not had an injury history of late, so that's a good sign too. The worst thing you can do is sign guys that – are like 32 years old coming off injuries, surgeries, the way DeMarcus Ware is, and then promise them money down the line saying, okay, well, you'll get healthy. That's always a dicey thing. So uh, to me, uh, I think that, that that ship has sailed with uh, Jared Allen. Okay, no Jared Allen, but we have many more questions here. Uh, we're going to answer another one here from Nate Trumbull. We certainly appreciate you logging on and joining us. Defense is the hottest topic for sure, but... Shouldn't the guard position be thought of high in the draft as well? Bernadeau's pay cut puts him in line with the swing guard center role, in my opinion. Um, nah. Defense, defense, defense is where I think the focus should be. Right, right now, he, he's the starting guard. It, it, you don't have to make a reach to say, okay, i got to go get one. I think you know they showed that the, Bernardo was, was good enough to play that way. Uh, if you happen to pick something up and he beats him out, fine. Uh, but again, yeah, he can play that role, and they probably would be happy with him as a swing guard and backup center. Uh, he probably still will be the backup center unless they go ahead and, and they find somebody else. But they've got some work to do at the guard position, obviously, uh, with Costa having right. moved on. Uh, and they really don't have another legitimate guy. Uh, Darian Weems, I think, is a guy that they'll, they'll take a look at. Uh, as a backup off offensive lineman. They looked at him at tackle. They looked at him at guard. Uh, that'll be somebody they consider. Uh, but again, I don't know that it's going to be a priority that you're going to say, oh, well, there's a guard in the first round. Let me draft him. Okay, Mark, Eric, your question's coming up in just a minute. Right now, we're going to answer Ezra Salami's question, who asks a second one here. Uh, you think the Bears and the G-Men, the Giants, of course, have other glaring needs that will cause Donald, I'm assuming he means Aaron Donald here, the defensive tackle from Pitt, uh, to to slip to us, to the Cowboys. Ezra believes that the Giants have needs at the tight end and offensive line, and the Bears have needs at safety and 
linebacker, do you think there's an opportunity for Aaron Donald to possibly be available when the Cowboys make their selection? Yeah, it's hard to hard to predict what other people Certainly. are thinking. It's hard enough to predict what these guys are thinking, let alone with uh, the Bears and the Giants are thinking. But uh, again, just because they signed Henry Melton doesn't mean the Cowboys just took Aaron Donald off their board like, well, we don't need him. They need all the guys they can get up front. And, you know, who knows? You, you get Aaron Donald, you have Henry Melton, and you find out which guy's best at the three technique, which guy's best at the one technique. You put them both out there. I, I don't I don't think the Cowboys are sitting there going, we're set for the future we signed Henry Melton. Because, again, remember, it's a one-year deal to start with, and if he doesn't prove himself, then he's a free agent. The Cowboys will say, no, we're not going to sign him to a three-year deal. And if you did that and you had Aaron Donald, then you have Aaron Donald to step right in. So uh, I don't think they're going to sit there and get greedy and go, oh, no, we got our guy. We don't need that other guy. I think that's still uh, on the table. Draft will be here before you know it. Lots of coverage planned surrounding the NFL draft, both here at Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour as well on Dallas Cowboys television stations. One more question here from Mark Eric. Certainly appreciate all of you asking questions here to us today. What's the word on Tyrone Crawford's progress? There's not been much news regarding his comeback. I just spent... About two hours with Tyrone Crawford. I've last been looking week. for him, and yes, you got him. Oh. I got him. Now, I'll tell you, it's difficult nailing down some of these players right. because they're in, they're out, they're spending time at home, spending time on vacation. Uh, I'll tell you, a lot of them though are right here at 9 a.m. in the Valley Ranch weight room or training room, uh, getting healthy. And Tyrone Crawford would be one of those guys. He gets here about 9 a.m. every morning, trying to rehab that torn Achilles tendon, which he tore on the very first day of trading camp last year. It was an omen of things to come, I think, <laughs> he fixed from an injury standpoint, well, yeah, right? you know what? He really had, and we'll get to where he is in just a moment, but his injury, and I know he was only going into a second NFL season, but his injury had a domino effect, I feel, on the defense last year. Oh, absolutely, because he was a guy that had a really good offseason. If yeah. you go back to his rookie year, he started coming on at the end of the season. He started showing up either playing defensive end or defensive tackle, an inside rush guy. Uh, and, and, they, and in the offseason, they were counting on him having a huge role on this team. And it could have been in a backup situation uh, because they were counting on Ratliff being here, which uh, I guess we know never that happened. happened. Uh, you know, they're counting on Spencer being here. That didn't happen. Uh, he was going to rotate in there, and they were really counting on him, and that injury was devastating. So he's sort of... The forgotten man. Everybody forgets. You know, who are they got? They don't have anybody. No, they've got Tyrone Crawford. And I've seen him out here working out, and he's running. And mm -hmm. I don't know what his assessment of his recovery is, but just watching how hard he's working, how hard he's running, the different things he's doing out there, uh, he looks like he'll be ready to go for the start of training camp. Yeah, he's he's here, like I said, every morning, 9 a.m. And then what he does, he goes into the film room. He's in phenomenal shape. He's about at about 285 right now. I believe we addressed this last week. He's not quite sure what his weight will be. It will depend on where he plays on the defensive line. He may have to lose a few pounds. Right. may have to stay at a heavier weight, depending on the position. But once he is done working out... I'll show you exactly what he does. He goes into the film room. Here's a picture of Tyrone and me just from last week. Um, he watches film. He watches film of other NFL teams, players that he can learn certain things from. He also watches film of Cowboys players. Learned a lot, he told me, from DeMarcus Ware, from Jason Hatcher last season. So he feels like he knows the game better than he ever has. He's focused. He's committed. He feels like he's in great shape and that he's ready to go. Obviously, you cannot mimic game situations right, running right. out here on the practice fields at Valley Ranch. But he's in phenomenal shape. Um ready to go, fully invested in this team. He kept his mind sharp. He always got this game film. He's like, oh my gosh, I sit at home, I watch film on my iPad. That's all I do. And his head's in the right place going into his third season. He wants to be a starter. He's motivated. He's pissed off. He got injured <laughs> last season. He knows that being frustrated about it doesn't serve him any purposes, but he's upset that he that he spent all of last season right. sitting at home. Sitting home and watching. And, uh, and that's a good thing. Yep. And like I said, uh, you know, when they drafted him, they thought he was pretty versatile. Now, he was a 4-3, if I remember correctly, he could play defensive end in a 4-3. They had him in a defensive end in the 3-4. Their idea last year was to check him out at defensive end on the strong side or check him out uh, possibly as the nose tackle. And the nose tackle in this 
4-3 defense of Marinelli's. They don't want a 330-pound slobber knocker in there. They want a guy that's big and strong, kind of a wide body, which he is, but can move. They, you know, And, and if he has to play there, I bet he plays at 290 pounds. Mm-hmm. He thought that when, when, when they decided that he was going to play defensive end uh, his rookie year, in the 3-4 that he needed to put on weight. So he kept putting on weight. He got to about 295 during the season. And then he said, you know what, I just felt sluggish. I didn't feel like me. He said, so I'm not sure where they're going to put me. But I remember talking to him. He said, I'm going to try to come in around 280, 285, and then let's see how it works out. Fascinating young man. Comes from a family of athletes. His mother was an outstanding athlete. His sister was the volleyball player at Oregon. Sister now works for Nike. Um, he played basketball. Didn't really get into football until right. later on in high school. And we, we and just, that's high school in Canada, exactly. by the way. But he claims that he, came from, that he comes from the football hotbed in Windsor, Ontario. <laughs> that is the football nerve center in Canada. And actually, uh, Kyle Wilbur and Ben Bass are going up to Windsor with him, I believe, at the end or middle of April. April, they're going to be hosting a football camp up oh, there. So they're really nice. trying to grow and nurture now, is football Windsor, in Canada. Windsor, that's what's right across the river from Detroit? Is that is that where? Don't ask me about my I Canadian geography. I'm trying to remember. Those of you who are much smarter about yeah, Canadian let us know. <laughs> geography, I know where Vancouver is. Plus, plus they have they have the ability to Google it now, right? Yes, you do. Can I tell you real quickly? I uh, I got a ticket driving from Seattle to Vancouver, Canada. I was driving from Seattle to Vancouver to go to a Canucks Stars game. I've made that drive. Yeah, got a ticket in Everett. Washington. I got out of the ticket, by the way. Or I got. I, I didn't have to pay the ticket anyway. I, I got. I got a lawyer to help me in Everett, Washington. But I will never forget that. So I know where Vancouver is very well. Not so much my geography. Last on time the I crossed the border there, uh, going into Canada, uh, making the drive from Seattle, and so our daughter was driving us up there, and and then he kind of looked at me in the back seat, and so what are you going to Canada for again? And I said, <laughs> I'm driving. To, I'm driving to Calgary. <laughs> Can I tell you, when, when when we went to, long story short, when we went to Canada, we took our dog with us. It was a beautiful, beautiful time of the year, so we actually flew our dog on American Airlines underneath in the crate because she's about 25 pounds, meaning she's too big to fit underneath the seat. We flew her on American Airlines, and, and we had all this paperwork we had to have for the flight, and we thought we needed the same amount of paperwork for our dog to cross the U.S.-Canadian border. So literally, we went through the Spanish Inquisition to get our dog on the plane. To cross the border, literally, you know what the uh, Homeland Security guy does? Looks in the back seat, cute dog, have a good yeah, trip. Have fun. <laughs> That's all Go. we needed. That's funny. You need nothing to cross the border. You need an act of Congress to get your dog on yeah. an American Airlines plane in the cargo hold. One more question here from Nate Trumbull, who submitted three questions during our Google Plus Hangout this and hour. And by the we way, he just sent me a tweet and said, thanks for answering my question. Oh, thank you so much, and thank you for promoting it on your Facebook page, Nate. Um, he wants to know, he knows a lot about you here. Uh-oh. I know you're a Mizzou guy and probably favor Ely at defensive end, but... DC D Ford as a legitimate pick at 16 for the Cowboys. What are your thoughts on where he could potentially fit? You know, I think D Ford is a first round draft choice. He may be a little later first round draft choice just because of his size. He, he's not the he's not the biggest guy. And uh, you know, when when you look at DNs, you want him to have arms like this guy had that was with Huge. us, yeah. uh, Caesar Long. Rayford, because uh, you got to keep those offensive mm-hmm. tackles after you. I like D Ford's motor. Uh, Talk to him at the Senior Bowl. Uh, he was he's pretty confident in his abilities uh, I think he, he, this is a guy that's been pretty good there for a couple years the thing Coney Ely from Missouri uh, it was almost like a one-year wonder I mean I think he had a decent junior year but this last year or whatever the year before was can't keep track of their sophomores juniors or seniors anymore uh, it was okay but it wasn't like this past year I think uh, D Ford uh, is better qualified right now uh, for if if you're going to end up a first round pick. 16 might be a little high for him, but again, if you like him and you want him, then you might as well take him and not take the chance of trading down because you got to get in the right spot where everybody says you got to get him, and then he's gone when you, when when it's your turn to pick. So if you like him, pick him. About 10 minutes here on Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour. We are taking your questions live via the Google Plus Hangout app or on Twitter as people are engaging with us on Twitter as well. So we know what the Cowboys did this week, Mickey. It was Henry Melton and Brandon Whedon. Um, I know that the Cowboys are not done, at least from a personnel standpoint. It seems like there is more work for them to do. 
what is your expectation in the next coming days or weeks? This team could, in terms of players this team could bring in or guys that they may be considering? I, I don't know if it's actively pursuing guys. You know, they made the, the deals with uh, Mincy, uh, with McLean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so they have a couple of another defensive end that has started in this league in uh, Mincy. Uh, McLean actually started as a rookie in Carolina. So these guys have a little something uh, that they like. Uh, again, I think they continue to bottom feed. I don't know that they go after anybody, you know, with a lot of, financial exuberance, uh, right. uh, meaning you're going to pay a big contract to somebody. So uh, I think one thing that it may not happen now, but it, it could happen closer to either the start of workouts or the start of training camp if somebody doesn't have a contract and you're sitting there going, well, is my football career over? Maybe you can look at it kind of a veteran wide receiver, somebody that's just a guy, a third guy that can come in. Because right now, if you look at this wide receiver core after releasing Miles Austin, the most experienced guy at wide receiver is Des, Des Bryant. Bryant. Yeah, and I think everybody thinks, well, Des just got here. Well, this is going to be his, his fourth what, fifth, fourth or fifth year. Uh, he, you know, he he's moving uh, right along. So they could use somebody to kind of mentor some of these younger guys. Uh, and again, I, I also think it's a position that in the draft they can't ignore because if you're sitting here going, okay, Des is a starter. Terrence Williams is a starter. If one guy gets hurt, who's the next guy that's going to start? And I don't know that Cole Beasley is a 60 snap a game outside wide receiver. They don't want to use Dwayne Harris that way right. because of the fact that he's so valuable on special teams. You don't want to wear him out uh, playing wide receiver. So really, you need you need someone else. And so uh, I would think they would keep a eye out for. Maybe a wide receiver that's kind of in the, and not from a talent standpoint, but kind of in that Will Allen category yep. from the previous year. Kind of a bridge, somebody that can hold down uh, the slot or a third position if, or a second position if he had to start. So maybe somebody that's 30, 32 years old that's willing to sign for a one- or two-year deal uh, for not very much money. And you find those guys when it's close to starting either training camp or off-season workouts because uh, guys are sitting there going, well, I want to still play, but no one's giving me any money. I better just grab what I can. And so that happens. Keep an eye out for that. And we've seen the Cowboys take advantage of players like that. Anybody want to mention George Sylvie from yes. last season? They've, they've had some success with players like that. You bring up Des Bryant and how he is now the leader in the receiving core. I want to show you what Des tweeted when the Cowboys agreed to a deal with Brandon Whedon. Needless to say, Des was happy That's that his another guy. former Oklahoma State Cowboy was coming to Dallas. Des tweeted, congrats to my bro at bweedon3, hashtag Cowboy Nation, baby. Now, th this seems very simplistic. Do you think that Des's relationship with, um, with Brandon Whedon would have any bearing on Whedon here in Dallas and what he could do with the Cowboys potentially? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much they would have, you know, talked to him about that. I doubt they that. talked or to him. I'm Des, talking give, about, yeah, no. give me a scouting report you, on this. I guarantee you they didn't talk to Des Bryant <laughs> about that. I'm going to go ahead and make that bold claim just from the standpoint of perhaps a comfort factor Yeah, yeah, I think forward. so. And it always helps when you come somewhere and you know somebody. Yeah. You know, uh, Henry Melton may be from Grapevine, Texas. He hadn't lived here in, you know, eight years. Right. So, but he gets here and Rod Marinelli's here. So that's kind comfort of a factor. comfort factor for him. Yeah, I think the same thing when uh, you walk into the locker room with a bunch of strangers and there's a face you knew from college days and it's like, oh, okay, I, I know you. And I think that helps out. It helps out the transition. It helps out all the, and you know, when you move somewhere else, you, you got to ask all the stupid oh, questions, yeah. you know, kind of yeah. find your way around. Well, if you got a friend to show you, then it's a lot easier to do that than always running into uh, the the human resources or into uh, Brian, Wansley's Brian Wansley. That's what I was trying to think of. <laughs> he, and going, he, he, Brian, how do I get to uh, the, the Gaylord? You know? <laughs> and you'll hear us mention Brian Wansley a lot. Very important guy to know. He basically uh, handles the the care and feeding of all the players for the Dallas Cowboys. I should also mention that Dan Bailey, too. Another former Oklahoma State right. guy. There are three now on the roster. I believe that's right. Bailey, yeah. Bryant, and Whedon. Well, wow. and... Who, uh, who am I missing? Uh, 
I can't remember if he's still here or not. Ori Lemon, is he still on the 80-man roster? I don't think so. I don't think so. finally, no, he's not here anymore. Boone Pickens is all very happy about the (laughs) influx of Oklahoma State Cowboys to the Dallas Cowboys roster. We're just about done here on Mickey and Miller's Cowboys Hour. One more point before we Mm -hmm. go. We said we'd address Orton. And, yes, and yes. let's let's do that. And, and so I'm kind of torn right now because normally if you see a player who's on the last year of his contract at a position where uh, the starter, you're the backup, and the starter is coming off back surgery and he starts saying, well, I think I want to retire. To me, that's agent talk for, I think my guy needs a raise. <laughs> so you're saying it's a leverage ploy. Well, it could be. Could be. But I've, I've kind of checked around, and somebody told me, no, he's not that type of guy that, you know, I don't think he would do that. He was seriously thinking, you know, I've been in this game for so long, maybe I'm just done. And he's got a pretty good contract right? already but, for a backup. But now here's the third part. He's got signing bonus money from the Cowboys. If he doesn't fulfill his contract, then he would have to pay back a percentage of that signing bonus that could be a couple million dollars. Mm. Now, I was telling somebody yesterday, I remember when I wrote my first check for like $2,000. You know how many zeros are in a $2 million uh, check that you would have to write back to this team? Yeah, six zeros. Your hand would be sitting there shaking going, <laughs> what am I doing? What am I doing? I can't give, I don't care how much money you've made, you don't want to write a check back that you, it's money you had and it's like okay I got to give back two million dollars so that blows my he's considering retirement theory <laughs> out of the water it's a leverage ploy he and his agent especially if his money. wife has anything to say about it <laughs> which we true. talked about last week we right? know that the women want the money I can certainly <laughs> speak to that uh, real quickly we got to talk about March Madness the NCAA tournament it is started. officially it is underway and Mickey I think I heard the earth rattle or felt the earth rattle when you told me you did not fill out a bracket. I didn't fill out a bracket, and and here's why I didn't do it. And I I didn't do it last year. And I enjoyed the NCAA tournament (laughs) immensely more than sitting there hanging on the edge of every last shot of every last game, hoping the team that I picked to win was going to go forward so I can get more points, right? And so I said, you know what, sitting back and just watching, because I like competition. I don't need anything uh, hanging on the balance of, of who wins or loses. And I enjoyed it a whole lot more. Because if not, I don't know if we would have done this now. I'd have been grinding <laughs> on those true. first two games that started at, what, 11 10, 11 15, something like that. They're probably at halftime right now. And I would have been here checking the score to so see funny. what was going on. So this is a lot more. You know, you're sitting there grubbing for one point, the first round games, right? I saw a tournament, uh, the guys that uh, uh, run GoVision yep. to do the outdoor boards at the Cowboys at AT&T Stadium, and they had, they had a deal for their workers, uh, a tournament pool. And not only did you get, like, first round one point, second round two points, but you also got the point total of the team's seed which encouraged okay, you to pick yeah. underdogs, the underdogs upsets, yeah. and pick the upsets, and you got more credit for it than just two measly points. Interesting. I thought that was a great concept. Anybody who picked a 116 upset, though, is an right? idiot, though. Or just go ahead and pick four of them, you know? And, yeah. and if you don't get it, all you lose is one point, right? But if you get them, it's 16. You know, I have a, I think I have a 215 upset. So who do you got? No, I've got a 512 upset. My big upset in the first round is Stephen F. Austin with the upset over Virginia Commonwealth. The Lumberjacks? Yeah, I do. It is the Lumberjacks. They're, they're a tough team. They play hard. I just wanted to go with the Texas team in the first round. My final Final four, Mickey. Do you think that's ridiculous? Uh, At Arizona playing Florida, okay. and then Iowa State. Iowa State. I'm a big Wichita Iowa State, State. fan, and uh, I, I would be pulling for Wichita State just to do something exactly. we haven't seen since yeah. 1976. Yeah. Wichita by the way. State, 34 and 0 this season. Right. And to go undefeated and win an NCAA title, Indiana was the last team uh, to do that with a guy by the name of Quinn Buckley playing for the Indiana Hoosiers and Bobby Knight. Don't remind me, Mavs. Quinn Buckner, okay, any of us who's a Mavs fan has a nightmare. Hey, I played high school football against Quinn Buckner. Did you really? Yeah, I did. Fortunately, Fortunately, I was on the sideline and he was on the field. Wait a second. What was he? Was he a defensive lineman? He was anything they wanted. He could have been the quarterback, he could have been the running back. He laid the same line, the linebacker, the guy that lit. And the last thing I remember on a return, he was the punt returner. returner, And a buddy of mine was the last guy back my size, size. And Buckner, who at that time, he was a freshman in high school. He must have been already like 6'2", 200 pounds. And he looked at that guy and he tried to run around. Around and ran right over Latin, 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 Latin
friend of another suffering action action and my job my job was to make sure all classes that are that are one day one day when we would school what position was you I was 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 I